a couple of you can put it on the chat box in the question window. Oh, very good evening to all of you for making time and joining us this evening. Um, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you on behalf of the NHRD Bangalore chapter. Uh, today's theme, theme talk is exponential organization. This talk couldn't have been more relevant than today as the world is experiencing a live exponential phenomenon. This experience and learning must not go waste. How can we use exponential power of technologies and management themes to make ourselves and our organizations relevant for the future? Our speaker for this evening, Suman Sasmal, will take us through that over the next 90 minutes. I'd also like to take this opportunity to quickly introduce Suman. Suman is an XLRI alumni. He has been a career professional for over 30 years and has held several leadership positions in the IT services industry. He worked across four continents in roles ranging from sales to PNL, service delivery to quality, corporate functions, among others. Known to be a people's leader and an acclaimed mentor, he has served Infosys for 15 years and has held roles of delivery center head for Bangalore and delivery head for a billion dollar business unit. Currently, he mentors startups and grown-ups at NSRCL in IIM Bangalore. In addition, he works with business leaders globally to help future-proof their business and transition into exponential times. He evangelizes the theme of exponential organization and speaks very regularly at various international forums and conferences. Once again, thank you, Suman, for jo joining us in the session. Over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Sindhu, and uh, very good evening uh, to each one of you. And I really appreciate you joining. Uh, these are very special times uh, for not just in our lives, but humanity. I just hope and pray each one of you and your near and dear ones are keeping safe and doing well. And uh, there couldn't have been a better time, as uh, Sindhu said, that we are experiencing life. What is the meaning of exponential? And here goes exponential organization. Now, this is not something a post-COVID afterthought. This is a subject that I have been working on for the last close to two years. So basically, if you look at uh, most of the organizations, they're designed for efficiency and predictability. And as a result, what happens is they don't scale very well and they lose agility, flexibility and speed over a period of time. And they develop some kind of an immune system that resists disruptive changes. And today, if you look at what is needed is to make sure that we come up with an exponential response uh, more than any time else, because we are faced with an exponential crisis. Even before, even in the last two years, five years, we have been going through exponential changes, but not really an exponential crisis of an exponential nature. Now that it has hit home very hard, all of us, I think it is extremely important that we understand what this whole beast is all about and how come this tagline that 10x is easier than 10% really makes sense to all of us. So just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, certainly, please put in your thoughts or question on the question window that you have. And uh, in case uh, uh, you have any questions, as I said, please jot them down. I will take a pause every 25 to 30 minutes and try to wrap it up uh, by around 7.20 and allow for adequate time for questions and answers. And I'll be happy to respond to them as they come. So. Uh, let me go through. It's a very premium time today, the next 90 minutes. Now, what are we going to do? So basically, my objective is to make sure that how we can collectively use this 90 minute to enhance your relevance in the changing world. And when you enhance your relevance, of course, your relevance, the institution or the organization or the enterprise or the business that you represent, that relevance automatically goes upwards. So we look at two things, essentially. How is the world changing? Yes, we all know, but we are going to take a nuanced view. We are going to take 
uh, you know, a, a viewfinder, which is an exponential viewfinder. If you look at it, this viewfinder is nothing but a bunch of exponential cuffs put together. And we'll take this filter to understand what the world is really looking like and how can we change this world? How can we make sure uh, that uh, we have the right tools, the right processes, the right understanding? Now, this is, of course, an introductory webinar to orient you to all these uh, stuff. This is by no means comprehensive, but nevertheless, you will get a sense of the possibility of such a thing in our lives. And that is what we are going to do today. So how is the world changing? Well, to many, the world is changing today in this particular way, right? We all understand this. Over a period of time, over the last few weeks, how things have changed. One has gone up and the other has gone down. Now to most, I would say, the world looks like this, which is a muddled stuff, which is very gray, which is a bunch of mud thrown in here and there. We can't make out anything of it, but I think it's our responsibility to understand the world a little better so that it clears up the mark and we really see how a beautiful Dalmatian or anything else is around, right? So uh, we have to frame uh, four possibilities today. Three of them are the problems and the one is the solution. So the first one is a nuanced version of the problem that we are faced with. It's not a problem, but it is something I would say it's a nuanced view of the world just to make sure that we are understanding the world in the right way. So the first is we are entering an age of abundance and we'll explain all of these in reasonable depth and detail. A zero marginal cost economy and what the hell that means. And of course, how higher value is getting created downstream. And we take a look at that. So we are entering an age of abundance. When I say that, let me, let me say this. Over the last 20, 25 years, we all know how just one technology which is information technology, which is exponentially powered by Moore's law, which we all know, has pretty much changed the way we live and we work. Now, just imagine if over 20 such technologies and domains, they are converging together with the price performance, which is exponentially growing exactly the same way that Moore's law has been growing over the last 20, 25, actually 60 years, but its impact has been felt more in the last 20, 25 years. Now, these are the technologies and many more, actually for want of space, I just left it to 12, but there are actually more than 20, 25, which are exponentially doubling every anywhere between 18 to 24 months. And when they converge, what truly really happens? So let's look at just two of them, solar energy and genetics. And let's make sure we understand what some of these impacts are. Now, when we look at some of these technologies and some of these domains, I think we can take one of the two views. Either we can take a Mad Max kind of a view, the movie Mad Max, if you remember, it's kind of going crazy, or we can take a Star Trek view. The Star Trek view is all about how we can make this aspirational. Now, today I would say, given the world that we live in, given the kind of professional background that we all have, I think it is not just an opportunity, but it's an obligation for us to really seize some of these moments, moments, the turning moments of our life, of humanity, to really make sure that we understand them right, we really take them and use them to not just create abundance, but change the world for better. And that is the theme of this conversation today. So don't try to read the curve. All that this is trying to show that solar has been on a roll. It has been on an exponential path for the last 50 plus years. If you look at the fundamental thing that powers solar energy, is that crystalline silicon photovoltaic cells, the silicon stuff. The price performance has improved 350x in the last 40 years. And as a result, if you look at, for most of the countries, the price point at which solar is being made available is anywhere between two cents a kilowatt hour to eight cents a kilowatt hour. And the cost of producing energy through the fossil fuel route if you look at coal or gas or even other terms of fuel, it costs anywhere between six to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's pretty much caught up and the curve is actually on an exponential uh, uh, path. So if you look at today, the world drives 3% of its energy from solar. 
Now it's on a doubling path. Just imagine all the percentages that you can see on the curve, 4%, 8%, 16%, 32% is going to reach in our lifetime, in the near future. And we won't be surprised if in the next 20 years, all the energy supplies in the world today is converted into solar because it's on a doubling path. And we understand today the doubling path better than ever before. Previously, I would take five minutes first to establish the theme of exponential. Today, I guess I don't have to do that. We all understand how the first 10 exponential steps yield only a number 1,000, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on. However, the next 10 steps yield a million, and the third then yields a billion. That's the power of exponential, and that is what solar is already on. Now, let's understand what happens. These are all good, fair enough. It's, it's a renewable energy, it's a clean energy, all this is good stuff, goes without saying, we all understand. But let's, let's look at some of the implications of this. When solar energy becomes near zero, it is predicted that it will be less than 0.5 cents a kilowatt hour sooner than later, perhaps reach in the next five years. What happens is it's a $6 trillion energy industry that's at stake. It shrinks to $1 trillion. That's number one. Number two, today if you look at the energy industry, it is centralized production, it's centralized distribution. It's a one-way distribution path. Tomorrow, it's decentralized production and decentralized distribution. It's all on a microgrid. So it disrupts the supply chain completely. Third, if you look at, it's the sunniest, some of the sunniest countries are some of the poorest countries in the world. So therefore, it kind of changes some of the geopolitical landscape in the whole world. What happens to the Gulf economy, right? What happens to, for example, access to clean drinking water? Why I'm saying this, look at it. Today, technology exists to refine even water from the drains into portable, safe, hygiene drinking water. But it is very expensive because it consumes a whole lot of electricity. Now, tomorrow, when energy becomes near zero, you can potentially get access to safe drinking water for near zero cost. Now, that's the good news for humanity. And what it does, today, 50% of the diseases in developing world is waterborne. So pretty much you can get done with the diseases. Now, that's again a great news for humanity. What's the not so great news? The not so great news, potentially an orthogonal impact on the pharma industry. Now they have to figure out to make money from somewhere else. Now that's a very bizarre way of looking at it, but that's what I wanted to make sure that we all understand it is not just one industry, one industry, one disruption potentially has effects, a lot of effects, first order, second order, third order effects. Now, how do we study these effects? So we'll take a look at some of those things. So basically, this is just one of them, and it is just not just one single energy of the silicon cells. It's multiple things coming together, which is really making it happen. It is material science, it's artificial intelligence, it's robotics, it's uh, crystalline cells, material science, and so on, right? Let's look at genome sequencing. This is even more bizarre. If you look at just in the last 20 years, the price performance has improved 100 million fold sorry, a million fold. It cost $100 million to do sequencing, genome sequencing, 3.2 billion pairs of DNA base pairs that we have in our body to sequence them. Now, what is sequencing? I'll shortly explain. Today, it costs less than $1,000. Actually, it costs $599. If you go to uh, Veritas Genome, uh, there's a company in the US, they do a whole body genome sequencing for $599. Now, what that does mean to us? Before I go there, if you look at the straight line curve is the Moore's law, which is all about the doubling price performance, you know, 1.5x to 2x kind of a growth every one year. That was what Moore's law was driven by. If you look at the genome stuff, it is even steeper. It is actually double exponential. It is 3.5x to 4x in given years. Now, at this space, when it becomes mainstream, when this becomes ubiquitous, what happens is we kind of convert healthcare problem into a software engineering issue. Because what are we doing? What we are doing is genome sequencing is nothing but our ability to read the genomes. Now, what's a genome? The 3.2 billion 
DNA base pairs is nothing but chemically coded information that we have in the body, which we are digitizing now. Now, once they are digitized, it is nothing but a bunch of 3.2 billion pairs of letters, which is absolutely randomly organized, rather disorganized. Now, how do you make sense of that? Just imagine you are given a book where the letters are not organized by chapters, by paragraphs, by sentences, by words. Would you be able to make sense of it? No. So therefore, genome sequencing exactly does that. And our human body is nothing but a software manual. It has got 23 chapters, which is like 23 chromosomes. You have DNAs, which are the letters which make up for the genes, which is like your words and sentences and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what a genome sequencing does. So it pretty much presents before the genome editor that this is what Mr. X looks like, why his or her hair, hair color is black or brown, why his or her, let's say, you know, uh, suffering from Alzheimer and so on and so forth. And we also have a tool now, which is the editing tool, which is like your Microsoft Word or any editor that you use, which is the CRISPR Cas9 tool, which is essentially like the Swiss Army knife. You can chop it, cut it, do anything with it. So pretty much in the hands of a CRISPR editor, there are magics that can happen. So when you have that, there is so much that you can do with it. And it's not science fiction, it's science reality. It's happening today. Last year, FDA has approved a gene therapy, which is to treat a muscular spinal atrophy in kids, which is actually a high mortality rate among kids, people who are, there's a genetic mutation disease that people suffer from, and there is already an approved therapy for that. So starting from disease management to disease identification, to genetic treatments that I talked about, you can go to the future. Future is all about, we have heard about cellular agriculture. Today we have to slaughter animals. It's not just about animal cruelty that I'm talking about, but just imagine a kg of red meat consumes 10,000 liters of water to make it, to produce it. Now today we have all become conscious about our planet. We can't harm our planet anymore. Now with that level of consciousness, how can we support cellular agriculture, a cellular meat production, which does not take any of the stuff at the same time it produces disease-free, infection-free, uh, 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 harmless, harm, uh, harm, harmless to the planet kind of meat at, at a very fraction of a price. So protein becomes abundant, right? So, so starting from that to the future of a CRISPR antibiotic or a vaccine, potentially you can have a vaccine in the future which can take care of all kinds of influencers, including the one that we are going through right now. Now, if you really look at it, abundance is a very relative concept. Let's look at this example. Let's say you have an orange tree full of oranges and oranges are accessible to even a kid who is let's say three and a half feet tall. Now he or she plucks all the oranges while at play and he's very happy he consumes them. Now all the oranges that were low hanging fruits they are all being taken. Then what, what he is left with? He is left with oranges, which are only at a big height, let's say at a six foot height. So therefore he can't access them. So the same oranges, which were actually abundant a week ago has become scarce now. Till he comes out with a technology invention called ladder. Let's say ladder was not there. And he invented now ladder. Then it becomes accessible. Again, oranges become abundant, right? Consider another example. Why do you think the tip of Washington Memorial Monument in Washington DC is made of aluminum? Because at that period of time, when it was built, aluminum was more expensive than gold. And then when the process of electrolysis came through, aluminum became very cheap. If you remember, if you go down to history, when King of Siam visited France and Napoleon III invited him for dinner, as a guest, he was served on an aluminum plate. The king himself was served on a gold plate and his ministers and his other officers of the court, they were served on a silver plate. So aluminum was scarce, but eventually technology makes it abundant. So in that sense, it's relative. Now I can't help talking about before I switch over from genomics. So we have a lot of assumptions. Today we assume 
that people typically as human beings we live for 70 75 80 years right i mean that's what we think anyone who is living beyond 100 oh man i mean he or she was truly blessed but look at it this way for the millions of years that we have been around on this planet earth for the bulk of the time till let's say a few thousands years ago the human longevity was 26 years for the longest of time it only became 45 years over the last thousands of years ago and today and even in 1919 it was 45 years and today it's about 75 years right because of the modern medicine and so on and so forth so what makes us think or assume that genomics cannot or biotechnology cannot stretch the longevity healthy aging i'm not talking of unhealthy aging but healthy aging as an example so these are points to ponder and these are points to think so this is technology creating abundance let's look at some of the cultural nuances and i'm giving you a few examples only i can go on on and on for each of these slides for even half a day or one day let's look at some of the cultural changes that are happening today something that was unthinkable we don't mind sharing a room in a stranger's home and that is what it is doing it is unlocking the locked up resources sharing of idle assets in a shared economy is a given thing today if you look at the open source initiative if you look at the burning man movement if you're not familiar with what the burning man movement is i will not get into the details please look it up after the webinar it's a very interesting concept that happens every year in nevada uh, in the us these are all giving pointers to the fact that the world is really going in for sharing of things sharing of their spaces uh, starting from uh, let's say microfinance to themes like pay what you want in restaurants to uh, workforce democracy to uh, self directed education all these things are nothing but uh, you know kind of uh, the movements that we are slowly getting into which is going to open up a locked up a uh, lot of locked up resources the third lever that i'm going to talk about what creates abundance is trust if you look at uh, internet i think internet as the first foundation technology did extremely good job in terms of doing three things it provided us with information example google search it helped us with distribution example youtube amazons it helped us with communication whether it's whatsapp emails and so on and so forth but it pretty much did not do two good things although that was an initial promise is that it would also provide for trust and intermediation actually it failed to do it trust where is trust we are full of fake news of the internet intermediation we thought internet is something that would empower everybody it has it has in many ways but at the end of the day the rise of the individual is in some sense there are whole lot of bigger intermediaries that we can think of look at all the trillion dollar market cap companies that is pretty much controlling our lives today so intermediation has not really happened because we have now large intermediaries that have been created now the point i'm trying to look at now is in a world that we live in everything is now getting abundant in terms of information we all know that there are 2000 dot satellites today in the next three to four years there is going to be uh, courtesy all the big companies the gaffers there are going to be about 20000 satellites now satellites scan image at a 1 meter resolution then you have drones there are going to be millions of drones already you know several but there are going to be several more they pretty much scan the earth at a centimeter resolution if you look at autonomous cars at a sub millimeter resolution if you look at ar glasses it's at a pixel resolution now if you combine all these and you have all the iot's or trillion sensor economy and so on in the next 10 years we already have 50 billion sensors pretty much we have knowledge of everything in the world so everything is knowable everything is transparent when you have transparency there is no asymmetry of information i think the whole things change right so uh, and the next now of course we are all familiar with blockchain now before i go in there if you look at it is the asymmetry that really creates a sense of mistrust look at it this way 
just imagine car buying and car selling second ad let's say if you want to sell a car now you only know that this car has been run been running very well it has got it has given you the minimal troubles and you can get a good price but there is an asymmetry how is the guy who is going to buy your car he or she knows that the car has not given you more trouble than uh, less and it is not a great car so therefore it's an imperfect equilibrium arising out of asymmetry of information and therefore there are intermediaries like a cars 24 or cars deco and so on and so forth they're trying to solve that problem if you look at majority of the institutions of the so-called modern world is based on mistrust right all the institutions that you look at every institution as humanity has created whether it is a political institutions or of the banking institutions or even educational institutions there's a fundamental mistrust in the whole thing and when you have technologies or other philosophies like blockchain can we potentially solve that problem of trust by removing intermediaries and that is going to create abundance of an extraordinary nature right now why i'm talking about abundance again i can go on and on take some time to understand this we have to move on if you look at scarcity is nothing but we have abundance in the world but it is trust that takes away that from that abundance and leads to scarcity so therefore scarcity equals abundance minus trust it's a very very uh, kind of a powerful statement please think through it that's what happens in the world even technology or not technology that is what is happening right now when things become abundant it changes everything because it changes the problem and it has to change the value proposition what i mean by that is if you look at any business in the world it is driven by scarcity if there was no scarcity there was no business right and when things become abundant you have to look at changing the business model you have to look at how you want to access the abundance examples right in front of us the favorite example photography when photography became abundant courtesy digital photography the prices dropped to become near free kodak failed to create value out of selling photographs instead instagram used the same photograph as the core ingredient but the business value or the business model was centered around relationship and they made a killing by selling their company for a billion dollar we all know right so so therefore this is what is happening to the world of abundance and how we need to take a view of that and change it a zero marginal cost economy business is always about a balance between cost of supply and cost of demand right now if you look at the cost of demand the marginal cost of acquiring an additional client has been dropping significantly over the last few years and few decades a uh, couple of decades at least just imagine if 20 more people want to join this webinar right now it doesn't cost a single penny so the marginal cost of acquiring demand has been dropping significantly now for the first time we are seeing a situation where the marginal cost of supply is also dropping significantly like the marginal cost of for airbnb to acquire 100 rooms in the city of bangalore or delhi is near zero right same 100 additional riders or drivers for uber is near zero so therefore if you really look at in an economy when everybody becomes a prosumer meaning an individual who is both a producer and a consumer the market economies fail the market economics so to say fails because uh, you know i mean things become near free for example information information we have been a prosumer for the last let's say actively for the last 10 15 years now there is no market regulation for that you and i can exchange so much of information without uh, a cost to it right and and pretty much uh, that's what is going to happen in several industries going forward and let me take a few examples so if you look at a factory which has been the conventional in the industrial age the source of fundamental source of value creation because we put in all the factors of production out there and it was very linear one-way process it started with production then distribution then sales then service and so on and so forth now it had served its purpose extremely well but the fallacy in that model is you are committing to upfront costs on the supply before you have been able to create your demand so therefore there is an extraordinary pressure 
to sell what you have produced. Now that is definitely a kind of asymmetry that no one likes. Instead, if you look at the new economy, which is centered around the platform model as we know, we are getting all the factors of business, not all the factors of production, all the factors of business together on the same platform. And so therefore, we are having a, a situation where supply and demand are kind of iteratively balanced and they are balancing the cost structure. So that's the fundamental difference. So uh, now if you look at uh, some of the old industry structures, let's look at transport industry for the last 150 years. What was, what transport industry constituted? Those are the few things that you can see in the slide, same as energy. Let me take one example of transport, how it is changing. The creation of logistics internet. What I mean by logistics internet is, if you look at a single problem statement, let me describe the problem. If you look at the US logistics industry, the trucking and logistics industry, it's pretty much a two trillion economy, approximately, these numbers are approximate. There are about 600,000 warehouses in the US alone. There are about anywhere between 12 to 14 million trucks that move around every day, which travel about 500 billion miles every year and staggeringly 35 percent of them are moving empty at any given point of time just imagine when we are mad about such planet issues we have 35 percent of the trucks not just in the us in fact world economic forum data suggests it's about 40 percent globally trucks move empty in the world simply because today they move between the point of production to the point of distribution and then very often they go back now, what if, if all these things were coordinated through nodes like the internet, think of the internet like what it is, right? Uh, every producer becomes a consumer, uh, there is a protocol, it is all peer directed and it's all on a network. What if all these 600,000 warehouses could come on a network? What if there was a standardized protocol binding them? And what if instead of a truck that travels from, let's say 5,000 miles across the coast, let's say in the US, the up and down time takes about 10 days because it's the same driver, it's the same truck, he has to take rest and so on and so forth. Tomorrow, what all that he has to do is to move the truck to the nearest node, which could be about 300 or 400 miles, and thus travels back with another truck to the same destination. So he gets to sleep at home, gets home cooked food, is under much less stress and causes less stress to planet Earth and the goods reach in five days, uh, in half the time than it was doing before. So when you have logistics internet, energy internet, and many such things coming together on top of an information internet, which was the first internet, the communications internet, I think we are headed for a very different world. So I look forward to your questions coming at this stage. Uh, please feel free, I can't see any of them unless uh, uh, Sindhu, Avinash, you can see, please correct me. I can't see any, uh, but I will move on in absence of any question. I hope to take a pause now. Any reflections, anything? Uh... Okay, let me move on. But yeah, Sindhu, you want to say something? No? Okay. All right. So, please look at. No questions, right? Okay. So higher value creation downstream, that's the other nuance. More and more higher values are created downstream rather than upstream. Every industry is kind of getting autom automated, right? We all know that. These are all 3D printers, robotics, and so on and so forth. I don't need to take time. What is happening is the complexity is growing in the consumption of products. Consumption is becoming the new production. Why I'm saying this is that in the industrial age, the focus was on the product. Do that focus has shifted very much on the consumer. And that means a whole lot of things. For want of time, I will not be able to give an example, but I would urge you to read a very famous case study that McDonald's went through, how they understood that they wanted to do something on the product, a milkshake product that was not selling well enough in the US. They went through the rounds of market research and so on and so forth and figured out that they needed to change some of the constituents of the product, which they did 
the sales initially went up only to come down after about three or four months. And then they approached Clayton Christensen, a reputed professor in Harvard Business School, who we lost the word, lost about two months back. When the research was given to him, he did not actually ask the clients or the consumers what they were looking for. Instead, he made some deep observations with a bunch of his PhD students, and he discovered, cutting a long story short, that they were actually not looking forward to any change in the product, but they were using the product, long distance commuters were using the product as a product companion early in the morning. 50% of the sales was happening between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. when in the US, most of the long distance commuters hit the road for going to work, as we all know. And these are the folks who were buying because they realized that this was being used as a commute companion more than a refreshing or a healthy drink and so on and so forth. As a result, they did two things because they wanted this companionship to last longer. Average time was 23 minutes. They did two things to the milkshake. They made the milkshake thicker and they made the straw thinner. And it lasted for 37 minutes instead of 23 minutes. Sales went up by 4x. So this is what I mean by radical view, radical intimacy with the customer. It is not the overall view, oh, I need this change in the product, make the price right, and so on and so forth. It is the intimate understanding because the consumption is becoming more and more complex. Let's look at the second frame. <clears throat> uh, so what is happening today? If you look at, there are multiple things happening. I'm just taking three views given the time frame that we are in. The world is burning much more money to get what it wants, and we'll explain. Enterprises are burning money too, often without results, and business disruptions galore, which you all know I don't have to tell you anything. Let's look at this curve. Year 2000, global debt in trillion USD. This is global picture, $34 trillion. Global GDP, 70. Look at the numbers, just do a simple arithmetic difference. We consumed $185 trillion of debt or we printed money, different countries printed $185 trillion for an incremental $43 trillion GDP. This is almost akin to that I am a business person, I am approaching a bank and I'm saying, I need a loan for 3000 rupees because I want to scale up my revenue by 1000 rupees. Which bank will approve this loan, tell me? So what are we doing to the globe? Now, this is a very different branch of economics and macroeconomics and so on. I'm not getting in there right now, but it has got profound implications, especially in a world that is led by technology because technology is deflationary. And global leaders, including economists, we have lived so far or for the bulk of the last few decades in an inflationary economy. That's what we are comfortable with. That's what our immune system is all about. And so therefore, we are trying to do we are trying to live in the dualities of inflation and deflation it's a very different debate i'm not going to get into that conversation i'm neither an economist but i just wanted to leave this thought behind that this is where the world that we live in this is not my saying this is something hbr in march 2019 came out with this article that 1.3 trillion dollars were spent by corporates and only 30 percent met with success because why because if you look at it they're all calling it a spend towards transforming their company a transformation to me is nothing less than metamorphosis. Like, you know, this, this lava getting converted into a butterfly. Now, which company that you know of has changed its form, shape, size, and color by which you can really say that's a butterfly, that a caterpillar is changing into a butterfly? Very few that I know of. Yes, let's look at history. Starting from a seashell trading company that we know Shell for, today it's a petroleum company, in March 2019, their chairman declared, which is captured in Financial Times UK, that they will become the largest renewable energy company in the world by 2030. They're not going to be in the business of fuel. That's a transformation. Or if you look at closer home, I'm sure there could be people on this forum from IBM. Even 30 years ago, they were a majority hardware company. Today, they are 100% software company, right? So this is transformation. They've done it very silently, but mind it, it's not an easy one, right? Look at this one, digital bank, digital banking. On the left-hand side, if you look at, this is Lumi Bank. This is Israel's oldest and one of the larger banks called Lumi Bank. 
the CEO had a tough time because Liuwe Bank is just like our ICICI Bank or SBI Bank, where they have you know the usual digital bank, meaning they give access to all the services like uh, raising an overdraft or requesting for a checkbook and transferring money and all of these things, uh, you know, all the digital bank services. So their employees didn't understand why we have to go for something called digital banking. Now, what's the difference between digital bank and digital banking? Big fundamental difference. As I said, digital bank is nothing but giving an access through digital channels to all the services or most of the services that you offer. Digital banking is completely different. It is about using data to, to create value and generate revenue, starting from engagement to doing everything, the front office, the middle office, the back office, everything is all seamlessly branched together in digital banking. For example, in ICICI Bank or SBI, you can apply through the, for loan sitting at home. It will take you maybe 30 minutes, but it will take the same four weeks of processing to get the loan, whereas in digital banking, it would be a matter of minutes. Let me take one statistic of my bank. My bank is a bank from Alibaba, from Jack Ma. Let me give this statistic. In the last four years that they've been around, or last four and a half years, they have lent out two nine. mind the numbers very carefully. They've lent out $290 billion to about 17 million small and medium enterprises. They operated on 3,000 data points before deciding on whether to give the loan or not. They took less than three minutes to arrive at the decision and less than 2% is their default rate. Now that for you is digital banking, right? So now when you have all these powerful forces going around, of course, there is no prizes for predicting whether it will rain. Rather, there is a prize for building the ark, right? That is what is happening today in the world. So what's really coming in the way before we get into really what could be a potential solution uh, i don't see any questions coming or thoughts or reflections i would appreciate uh, but uh, anyways i will go on in absence of any but this is a good time for them to come in so what's really coming in the way yes exponential technologies put a blind spots the orthogonal impact and sense making difficult and the changing business model you know, it, it's kind of, it doesn't come easy. It, it's fairly difficult. So let's, again, uh, peel the onion a little further, right? Oops. Yeah. So, so this we all understand, I've explained. 30 linear steps, travel 30 meters. We have been wired. We have grown up in a linear world. So therefore, our brain thinks linearly. 30 exponential steps make you move 25 times on the world. So that's difficult, we all understand. It is pathologically deceptive. What I mean by that is, again, we understand, let's take the example of a bamboo tree. This is a species of bamboo which grows in Assam in India and also in China. For the first four years, if you grow it, if you, if you sow it today, it won't even grow an inch. It will pretty much won't even come off the soil. But five years, and five weeks, it'll be 80 feet tall in just five weeks. If you ask the question, was it really dormant all this while? No, it wasn't really dormant. It was actually building a root system strong enough to withstand the sudden growth of 80 feet high bamboo grass. And that is what is actually happening in the world of some of these exponential tech, not just technologies, even all the domains that I've talked about. Let's look at the left hand side, the GPS. GPS essentially is a second world war technology. It used to be called low run, long range navigation. It is used in maritime and shipping today. In 1973, when the first commercial model of GPS was launched, it used to weigh 25 kgs and cost $125,000. Today, it's about a few cents. But we think this GPS is a creation of the last 15 to 20 years at the most, right? No, it is not. It is of the last few decades. 3D printing, who amongst you would have heard of 3D printer 10 years ago? It was there in the 70s. It was called stereolithography. Again, over a period of time, it evolved. And when the patent was lifted off FDM, fusion deposition modeling, it went through the roof and things are where it is. If you look at electric vehicles, the first electric vehicle was launched in 1995. It took the first 18 years to hit the first million, the next 18 months to hit the second million, eight months for the third million, 
and now it is yours and my guess it is going to be a few weeks and few days going forward so if you really look at it it is the deceptiveness of the whole thing so how do you really make sure you are able to scan and understand when the tipping point is going to arrive because the moment the black swan moment arrives you are already late and then there is nothing that can happen then it's already off the charts orthogonal impact impact that was not intended for if you look at a company called taxla it's a value based generic company so they married the genes of a firefly a fly that glows in the dark with genes of a plant and as a result the plant leaves started glowing in the dark great now their plans are to plant these trees on city streets as a result what would happen the city won't need any street lights guess a genetic company disrupting a lighting and an energy industry now you can't even think of some of these possibilities let's look at this company uh, check it out uh, focus at will.com all that they do is live stream music through a headset that they give it to you for $69.95 lifetime subscription they will curate it till you hit a stage where you are able to focus on anything that you are doing especially at work forex guess who are the disrupting if you look at people in the us or people even in bangalore the gig workers the the startup folks they all go to coffee shops it seems the buzz in that environment makes them very productive whatever that means to them now these folks are able to get the same thing done by focus at will it is disrupting coffee business big time so most of the disruptions as we know uh, i mean always would come from outside the industry i mean today when we ask this question who is your competition i mean it's, it's a crazy question to ask because none of the disruptions that happened in the last 10 years came from any company in the same industry so what's the point so then what is the solution these are all great stuff so the point is we'll come to the solution changing business model is not easy because it is always the change you are always weighing it up with the risk and risk will always be weighing it up heavier because you don't know what is ahead you don't have answers to some questions there are unknown unknowns as you know there are known knowns known unknowns unknown unknowns most of the situations will be an unknown, unknown 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 and which company i mean when i say which i am exaggerating to prove a point which company tell me would allow their brightest of their staff to invest their time and resources on something which is an unknown unknown it doesn't happen right for the right reason i'm not saying the wrong reason but that actually where we lose out the opportunity so this is something which we all know that we all go through all these incremental innovations the continuous improvement and all this good stuff for which we have enough and more schemes in any company but we don't have anything for disruptive because that needs a risk of a different nature it needs a culture and a climate of a different nature it's more culture it's not ability it's not technology it's not anything and we'll come to that and disruption is all about how you make the old thing obsolete right i'm not getting into the mechanics of uh, what is a disruption versus innovation but a fundamental thing is something that makes the old way of doing things obsolete right we would take a taxi to go to the airport today we take an uber right it makes the old thing obsolete because something that is so convenient so good so easy so affordable and so on right so the last problem that i'm going to talk about is that most large enterprises or business and the longer the business has been in existence the stronger is the immunity system simply because technology moves on this exponential curve but if you look at the individuals if you look at the enterprises they pretty much follow a curve which is much linear and there is always a growing gap and this is the gap that is not very uh, welcome for anything that we want to do and immune systems are built up for a reason because all the companies were born not to disrupt themselves every day or every week they were born as i said to deliver predictable performance with efficiency and so on and so forth so therefore anything that it considers you know an attack a virus attacking the the uh, you know a new idea is essentially an attack right on the immune system it will kind of throw it out and and this is exactly what it happens so corporate immune system essentially ends up killing the host because these are all the things that you know i mean it's not a good thing like no experience you know i mean we all celebrate experience we all think experience is a great thing yes i too believe that but let me let me provoke a concept what is experience at the end of the day when you do the same thing 201 times that's your experience 
when i tell you therefore do this in a different way do you think you are going to do it on the 200 second time a different way no way you're going to say i have done it all my life this way and it works the other way you are suggesting it will not work so avoid the expert if you want to do something new if you want to do something crazy you want to do something disruptive even the day before some something is disruptive it's a crazy idea don't forget that if something is truly disruptive it's actually a crazy idea now you don't have an experience in that now that's an immune system response it's all stupid ideas right it's all experimentation we can do without and so on so those are the things that is actually the immune system now what is this all about so i would say of course take a pause take a deep breath i know right now we may not but actually we need to do that we are on the treadmill we have done the things well enough and we have been i have been saying this not today because it's a COVID time of course i have been championing this for uh, quite some time now and it is already better let than never we take a pause because when we take a pause we can rethink we can reframe our problems we can reconfigure our lives our business everything right reimagine things and that is what is exactly needed so how can you change this whole damn thing so let's imagine the original organization looks like a square so we go through what is called a sprint process uh, uh, which we'll explain but just imagine the arrow is nothing but represents the sprint process which is nothing but a culmination which essentially is a culture changing thing and a number of stuff that happens and the new organization that it kind of results in is the form of a circle meaning there's a whole lot of changes that has happened to the squarish looking organization keeping the business model impact what is the business model business model is the way that you create value deliver value and monetize the value that has not changed but you have done something to really change and make it more efficient and so on if you look at the green small circles i've called them the new exos the new exponential organizations and the new exos are that organizations at the edge which is completely different a complete different uh, uh, you know business model and so on let me take an example and and eventually what can happen is the original organization becomes small and the exponential organization can become big right let's look at some examples uh let's say marriott if marriott the current marriott as it is let's say if they implement let's say a lot of uh, let's say ai driven uh, let's say concierge services you know it makes it very efficient very personalized very immersive very interactive and uh, you know it therefore uh, promotes a whole lot of footfalls it uh, increases uh, uh, you know utilization and so on and so forth so let's say that becomes the modified marriott that's great but what would be an equivalent of a marriott's age organization if for example marriott had gone into an airbnb assume airbnb came from marriott assume a booking.com came from marriott assume a trip advisor came from marriott eventually what would happen is airbnb would swallow out marriott and airbnb would become that new organization right that is the disruption that we are talking about so some of the people who have gone through some of the big companies that i've about, there are several of them this guy is png global png tony saldana uh, this guy is paul polman uh, former ceo of unilever and they have all been very excited about the possibilities of this uh, of what i call the exponential organization which is essentially a concept that can be uh, you know pushed into a regular cycle and then look at what uh, Unilever uh, talks about, just hold up. Yeah, so, so basically what are the three things uh, that we are going to now look at? Find a large enough problem, acquire an exponential mindset and adopt tools, frameworks, and this is the last section of a talk we should be done in the next 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so let's look at a large enough problem. This is New York City, year 1893 look at the poo problem of the horse poos horse cart 100000 horses releasing 2 million pounds of manure daily come on who will clean it like it's a huge exponential problem i mean it's just on a lighter note i picked up this problem statement but it's a problem let's look at 
what London, uh, this this uh, site says, in 50 years, we'll be buried under nine feet of man here, right? I mean, this was in, again, 1894. So if it stinks badly, literally, people will welcome change. Not that because of this, cars came up, but because of this, look at the exponential adoption of cars. On the left-hand side, this is year 1900, Fifth Avenue, New York City. Everything is a horse buggy. 1913, in 13 years, everything is a cart. So basically, the ad adoption becomes exponential when you are trying to solve a large enough problem. Not that it was solving the problem of horse poo, but it was a problem. Henry Ford, of course, tried to solve the problem. It was actually an exponential organization. They didn't have that fancy name, but yes, Henry Ford achieved a $2,000 car into a $500 car. It's a 4X improvement. Tell me which company that you know of today, a legacy enterprise that is working on a theme of 4X improvement. We get a double promotion if we deliver a 15 or a 20% improvement on our revenue and margin. Talk of, let's not talk even about 4X or even uh, 2X improvement, right? So this is, so let's look at this. When things go complex, then again, you need to think some more of uh, this thing. Let's, let's Don't look at this. Don't waste your time talking. All around us a new beginning. Let yourself in the sea, keep a flow. Waiting for your wave, crash your wave again. Yeah, so basically, when you have 8,000 cars, collaboration could work. People crossing, cars, horse cars, everyone. It's like a chaos. It's like uh, what we have in, have in India even today. But when we have... 8 million cars. By 1920, we had 8 million cars in the US alone. And you need a new operating system. Collaboration will not work. In an increasingly complex world, we all celebrate collaboration today, but we are getting into a very complex world. We are already in a complex world. We need a new operating system for most of the things that we deliver. So the traffic light was nothing but uh, a new operating system. So, so basically, all that we have to be very careful about is that what is the large problem we are trying to solve, right? And there are so many problems today, whether it is insecurity, joblessness, inequality, planet, you know, governance, disaster, anything we can choose. And we will see that there is so much that we can do. And it doesn't have to be like, uh, you know, I mean, these are all uh, not-for-profit social organizations. No. If you look at, I, I mean, I will be able to show you the Unilever's video, then you will be able to make out what they are doing. Unilever's, of course, is not a social for-profit, uh, not-for-profit company. It is a for-profit company, but with a great social this thing. And something they adopted as a cause, only after Paul Pullman, their chairman, he embraced the theme of an exponential organization. Yep. So 10x versus 10%. And I said, I started with the tagline, 10x is easier than 10 percent yes it is 100 times more worth it but is it 100 times difficult no not at all let's just look at it you all that you have to do is to shift the perspectives so uh if you look at this in fact last year i had traveled in three countries in africa and these kind of roads are very common even a four-wheel drive will kind of fail what is the first thinking that will come to anyone's mind let's get them some money from world bank or any of the oecd countries and let them help them build some roads but when you ask the question what they need the roads for yeah they need the roads for access to education access to healthcare, and all the good stuff access to markets and all of that right but then why you spend billions of dollars and roads take some a few years to construct why can't we leapfrog just shift your perspectives when all these technologies are available Prices are dropping, price performance are an exponential curve. All these things are a possibility. So 10x needs just the thinking, a shift of perspectives. It does not mean a 10x complicated stuff, right? Now, what's an infinite mindset? You know, especially in today's times, we are all confronted with questions. Should we be at it, not be at it, and so on and so forth? So Simon Sinek, I'm sure all of you know who he is. It's an HBS professor. It's, it's a fantastic thinker. I recommend this book. And he talks about, you know, how in the vietnam war how north vietnamese they lost majority of the battles right they lost majority of the battles they lost three and a half million of their soldiers 
as opposed to the Americans who lost only 58,000 soldiers and they won all the major battles, but they lost the war. So you lose the war winning the battles. And why? If you look back, I mean, the strategic choices that, uh, you know, the North Vietnamese could make because they were not fighting to win a battle. They were fighting for their lives. They're fighting for a cause. They wanted to play because they wanted to play, be at it. They want. They were in the whole thing because they wanted to be in it. Whereas the Americans were in a rush to win the battles and go back home. As a result, it didn't, you know, I mean, uh, win much of a support back in the US, which of course a long story, I'm sure many of you know. And eventually uh, they had to abandon and they had to really uh, this thing. So the point is, how do we now go through an infinite mindset? If I really do not put purpose in front of me, I will operate with a finite mindset. And that is the value of purpose. And purpose is becoming a coin. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of currency of conversation today, as we all know. Again, it's the other thing. We all love to run marathons because, you know, we are there since 1837, still going strong, or since 1951, still going strong, and so on and so forth. Now, the point is, when you are running a marathon versus a sprint, it's a completely different training. It's a completely different attitude. But at the same time today, I think, uh, and, and at the same time, we all know that never you will see a sprinter running a marathon and vice versa. But today, I think the truth lies in the duality of the whole things. You have to run multiple sprints over the distance of a marathon, which I called a sprintathon. I think that is extremely important. Problem is that we are all stuck in the mindset and how do we get rid of that? So some of these tools, frameworks, and processes can help. So these are some of the exponential organizations that this book, in fact, this entire process is open source to two books, Exponential Organization and Exponential Transformation. This is not the creation of a framework. This is reverse engineering. A bunch of researchers led by Salim Ismail, who is an Indian born Canadian, who co-founded Singularity University in Palo Alto in the US. They looked at close to 150 odd exponentially growing companies, and they figured out what are the things that are common in them. and then they really came up with a process and a framework which will uh, shortly share with you and something that really make this change happen. So it has, it is supported by a number of themes and tools and I will just quickly brush them through just to give you a sense that this is a very rich concept and very rich tool. Just look at this. All the time we are trying to change the answer. We are trying to make things faster, better, cheaper, which is all about changing the answer. When you change the question, the answers that you get is very different. For example, let's say you are in the business of making batteries. So your question is, how can we make the batteries better? Let's say it is lighter, it is cheaper, it lasts longer and so on. Instead, what if you ask the question, how can we make portable power? Now that's a problem you're solving. You're not in the business of battery, you're the business of portable power right? So you're changing the question. For example, I often tell this, uh, share this with my, uh, you know, the startup that I mentor is a story of a mousetrap. If you're building better mousetraps every year, then there is a limit to how better you can make your mousetrap. Till you ask the question, what is the objective of mousetrap? Is it to catch mice or is it to keep the home free of mice? When the answer is to keep the home free of mice, then you don't invent a better mousetrap then actually you look for a chemical, which is actually US patented chemical that is available, which when you mix with the paint, it keeps the home free of rodents day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And you don't sell a mousetrap anymore. You sell a subscription service to the homes, let's say 41 rupees every month, month after month, year after year, which is a better business. Changing the assumptions, changing the assumptions, again, you can understand it's far more powerful, it's far more disruptive. Because everything that we say, if you really notice, more than half the things that we're saying are assumption. For example, we eat food. I mean, the question is, uh, why do we eat food? And you start from there, you will start seeing there's a bunch of assumptions being made. When you change some of the assumptions, you will see there are some disruptive thought processes are coming into play, yeah? So, uh, I have already covered this. Uh, so if you really look at, when you start asking some of these powerful questions, for example, today's time, it is so relevant to ask this question. If you are starting all over now, whichever company you come from today, whichever enterprises you come from, 
or even as an individual, you can ask this question to yourself. If I'm starting my life or the business life all over now, what would the company be doing and how differently would we operate? Would we operate in the same way? No way. In fact, I was coaching one of the companies in Dubai and this is a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, South African folks who is leading uh, a big uh, construction company out there. And they are the, it's, a, it's a, a traded company. And they said that, look, we have been running this company for 20 years. Now, today, everything is changing in construction. Now, we would love to, uh, you know, ask this question, of course, which is prompted by us, that uh, if you were to start this company all over again, how would you do it? Would you do it the same way? Of course not. And they made that comment even today, and this is what it takes to really be great leaders, that when we have the operating model as a blueprint ready, we are willing to step out because we will not be able to run that company because all that we have in our blood is to run this existing company is the existing operating model. We need some other people to run this company now. And that was really, really very, very uh, thought provoking uh, for all of us in the room. Yep. And they are the founders of the company. Look at it very carefully. It's an interesting video shot in Masai Mara. <clears throat> They don't care. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what. So there are three messages. <clears throat> so people who are busy doing what they are doing every day, you know what happens? People who are at least agile and alert and scanning the horizon very intently, they at least save themselves for the day. And there are always people on the prey who are out there to take the mails. And this is what this guy does so well. He always looks at this curve, the exponential curve, and he starts inventing a little ahead, it can hit the black swan moment. You look at each of these investments, this is what he does. And he always starts by asking those fundamental questions, which is nothing but, what is called starting thinking from the first principles. And this is what he does extremely so well. So <clears throat> then there's another instrument I can talk about is uh, taking a radical view of customers. So I'll make it very quick. What I mean by that is which company on earth doesn't say we are customer focused. Everyone says that, but let's look at this one. Of course, everyone knows the Netflix blockbuster story. When this was put forward before blockbuster, their board refused it because it was 12% of their revenue. Late fees was 12% of their revenue. Netflix saw that as an opportunity. It's a weakness. They are taking undue advantage of their customers. They could be customer focused, but they're taking undue advantage. And there are millions of examples. Just look at airlines. You cancel the ticket. You don't get back anything. You possibly are canceling the ticket in the 11th hour. The airline company is making a lot more money because you might have bought the ticket at 3,000 rupees. They are selling it at 12,000 rupees. You don't get anything. That's an absolute undue advantage they take out of it. What if an airline comes by disrupting this? Look at oil industry. This is a famous term in economics. You would know, some of you would know that there's a feather rocket effect in petrol prices. When the crude oil prices shoot up anywhere in the world, not just India, Prices go up pretty much within days. When the prices fall, it takes a lot of time. So it shoots up like a rocket. When it goes up, it falls like a feather, slow feather, this thing. What if a company comes up and it's a template to do that, to really just uh, do the reverse, that you are always making your oil available real-time basis as they happen. Look at what happened to Santander. This is a European bank. They were making a whole lot of money out of foreign exchange. So a company called TransferWise, uh, I mean, they saw this as a great opportunity and they broke the entire complete thing. 10% of the margins of Santander Bank was coming from Forex, you know, the, the asymmetry, which TransferWise broke for not just Santander, but every other bank. And today, uh, TransferWise and Beans and all of that have disrupted that space. So basically, this is called what is an asymmetric uh, you know, uh, this thing in part. Then the business model canvas is a very useful tool. 
Of course, we're not getting into the details. This is a fundamental tool because this allows you to experiment. Because when we are talking about disruption, we have to continually experiment the mode of our value creation, value delivery, and value monetization. And this is what is the essence of the framework. What it does is, if you look through, we have talked about all the changing narratives and the concepts of abundance. We have talked about how the community and crowd and the social commons, it's an economic model. When the market economics may fail, it's the social commons that will pick up again. It's a term that is worth reading and explaining later on. And when you have access to power, the power of algorithms, the power of computing, how you can leverage some of these things, stuff and demand, community and crowd, algorithms. Let me take a few examples just to drive the message home. Let's say algorithms. When you are, uh, you know, I mean, drawing a power of algorithms, I mean, the, the power that is released by algorithms. Let's look at an algorithm called page rank algorithm of Google. It used to on Google, I think about $2 billion was its revenue in the early 2000. And today it earns about $2 billion every alternate day. It's the same algorithm, the power rank algorithm, the page ranking algorithm, right? I mean, that's the power of algorithm. Look at UPS trucks. They drive 55 billion truck miles every year and they save $1 billion because the way their routing system works. For example, no UPS truck, many of you would be aware, takes a left turn. They take a right, right, and a right on each block, and they have seen that this particular thing saves them eventually time and money and everything. And as a result of many such algorithm stuff that they use on their routing of the trucks, they save a billion dollar every year on fuel and effort and so on. And then there are leverage assets. For example, we are talking about supply side dropping significantly. So how you can leverage someone else's assets and not do the same thing yourself, right? Access, the, the, the new mantra is not ownership, it's access. The world is going away from ownership. When you have abundance, there'll be a little less urge to own anything. All that you need is access to things, like ask any millennial, he or she will tell you about that. So this is something, how the process will take you through this, to access abundance in the world. Because when you access abundance in the world, you are basically taking care of a number of things, including your falling you know, marginal cost of demand and marginal cost of supply. And similarly, on the right-hand side, it's your ability to manage the abundance. Because when you have abundance, it's not an easy thing to manage that abundance. How do you take care of that? Examples of community and crowd. Look at, look at the TED conferences. TED was there, has been existing since the 1980s, right? For the first 20 years, it was those big mega conferences, power speaker, power audience, expensive tickets, and you know, everyone liked it and so on and so forth. 2004, when their new CEO joined, he wanted to democratize the whole thing. As a result, he formed the purpose-driven community called TEDx community, which was all about, you know, ideas worth sharing. That was their purpose. And as a result, by, by till date, since 2004, they have been able to deliver 20, over 20,000 TEDx conferences. They don't work for a single penny. These are all volunteer groups. It is the power of community that is being drawn. And I can go on and on of all these things. The Quirky, the localmodels.com, the, the uh, let's say, Xiaomi, uh, Xiaomi, the mobile phone. They don't have a, a product, so-called product department. Who decides their features? Who decides what the product release, uh, what the next product release will be and the features that it go in? It is their super user group. Who is the super user group? Some people like you and me. So this is completely community and crowd and a purpose driven kind of an exercise that's happening today. And that pretty much throws not only the cost structure, but also the thought structure because innovations happen when a lot of different minds which are not aligned by a single frame of thinking in a particular enterprise that comes together is a different thinking from different corners of the world coming together and this is a sprint process that actually takes through takes people through, through all this stuff to eventually identify some of these things and it starts with the power of purpose so this is the levers video that I'm, i was talking about <laughs> Thank you.
So, if this is the power of purpose, look at some of the, you know, all these are, uh, what would I say, legacy companies, how they are really realigning themselves with the power of purpose. They also have the vision. They also have the mission. Vision is all about where you want to go, that big picture. Mission is all about how you are getting there. Purpose is about why do you exist? Why do you do what you do? So for Unilever, it's about to make sustainable living commonplace. And these 28 brands, which have been able to convert to purpose-driven brands, the rest of the brands are still not well, there from a purpose-driven perspective, and they have close to 100 brands, I guess. So these brands are delivering bulk of the growth and bulk of everything else, right? I think that's something that really uh, you know shows the power of things. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to skip all this uh, for now, but there are all these companies who are exemplar companies when it comes to some of these elements of the framework. This is the canvas. It is an equivalent of business model canvas, but when uh, some of the framework elements are thrown around on them, how the canvas looks like, these are different tools. This is how do you decide, for example, the UDA framework. How do you decide in a combat operations, the QNF model in a crisis kind of situation, in a future scenario? See, I think two things are very important. One is the scenario planning tool and the other is the futures wheel, which come very handy because when you don't know how the first order, second order, third order impacts would look like, for example, take this corona situation. What we are seeing today is not even the zeroth order, which is just about morbidity healthcare challenges post this there'll be first order second nth order kind of elements that we have to go through right so <clears throat> that's what many of these tools will take care so uh, there's a series of phoenix webinars workshops and the sprint process that has products that are offered for various enterprises various individuals institutions and including governments including government of thailand government of colombia uh, in, in fact, Prime Minister Modi has also had a conversation with Salim as to what can be done uh, for implementing some of these themes into even some of the India's landscape. So, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I would. Uh, uh, so we have time, and I can stay on for a little longer for sure. I don't have a problem as long as you want to carry on. Please do that, and I will share with you. And what's the outcome of any of these processes? Is that anywhere between six to ten exponential initiatives uh, one is uh, identified with uh, uh, but more importantly what is uh, this thing is that how to make people comfortable with the uncomfortable how do you see the disruption process in action it changes the culture i think that's the biggest takeaway of the few people that go through this typically 20 25 people go through this process in most of the large companies and they start the seeding and then it can be replicated and this is, as I said, everything is available in the books, exponential transformation, exponential organizations. These are all open source. These are all available without any external help as well. Yep. So uh, this is what I would love to hear from you at the end. But right now, it's time for any of your thoughts, reflections, questions. And as I said, many of these are perspectives. These are not like a scientific equation where A plus B equal to C. These are some thoughts to provoke you, nudge you. Uh, if you have some alternate perspectives, I'd love to hear love your challenges love your thoughts love your questions and at the end if you could write this i would be glad and i will share my email id at the end sindhu you want to hello coordinate? yeah yeah uh, suman we have a few questions from the participants yeah i was not able to see them though so i really don't know what yeah. happened. Uh, can anyway, i share please. it now yeah, 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 please. So uh, one of the questions is, um, can you share some perspectives on customer experience design in the context of exponential paradigm? Share some perspectives on customer experience design. Yeah, so so absolutely. If you look at, uh, okay. Okay, so if you look at engagement, if you look at the left-hand column, that stuff on demand community engagement. So engagement is the space where the customer experience design, the interface is another space. So there are a lot of, uh, 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 I would say, space holders for customer experience. It, 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 it takes a little different meaning than the pure play customer experience that we are talking about. But again, if you are starting from the problem statement, what problem are you solving? And 
it, it's a very deep rooted uh, you know kind of sense it takes customer experience will be an integral part of that and then on top of that if you consciously plug in the elements of engagement and interfaces, which of course for want of time and that's the limitation of these short webinars, I could not explain to you what are the elements of engagement of interfaces. One option is you can certainly read the book or we can have a later on our conversation. Certainly these are stuff that is plugged in. Yeah. Yeah, next. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you bring in health? Care internet scenario. Healthcare into healthcare internet scenario. I think this was during the initial discussion that you were, you know, uh, yeah, talking yeah. about the abundance. And... Yeah, I mean, healthcare uh, absolutely. I mean, healthcare. If you look at, uh, there are so many technologies. Uh, I just talked about biotechnology, which is genomics. Genomics is just one part of it. Let me give share another perspective. Protein folding. So protein folding uh, is uh, basically protein folding is an algorithm that is very heavily used for people who are, uh, you know, the, the uh, discovery of drugs and drug manufacturing and so on and so forth. Protein folding is a heavy science without getting into the details of it. Every alternate year, there's a global forum of protein folding experts. Typically, these folks are double PhDs in that subject and so on. And they kind of go through a collaborative competition in terms of whose algorithm has really made a huge progress. And then, you know, someone who gets the top ranker, second ranker, and third ranker. And goes without saying, people with such deep expertise who have been, you know, there, they've been done it, they get these awards. Look at it. In 2018, this event happened in Cancun, Mexico. And guess who won this award? It's a team from DeepMind. It's a team from Google's DeepMind, a bunch of techies who don't have any clue about protein folding. They just use algorithms to crack this whole thing and they won the top award. They cracked the protein folding algorithm. So, so it is going to get potentially drug discovery off the charts anytime soon. Today, if you look at the drug discovery industry, it's a very slow and an expensive process. It's a 12 year process. Chances are less than 10% from clinical trial stage that it will make to the bedside from the uh, uh, R&D bench to the bedside, the probability is less than 1%. It's a $12 billion process, 10 year process with less than 10% probability. Now, which company do you think will invest so much of money? Of course, there are there for only few companies and it's a cart kind of cartel that is there. Now, this is going to potentially get the things off the charts. And then when you have technologies, which is uh, fast tracking clinical trial mechanism, when you have uh, precision medicine, courtesy gen genetics and so on, it is going to be completely redone. That's why I said today, what is our assumption? Our assumption is that we live for 70, 75, 80 years. But tomorrow when these constraints are taken off, for example, today, yes, we might think that uh, the human genetic engineering is absolutely unethical and so on and so forth. Let's assume that we are able to break through that ethics, that dilemma, and we are able to use uh, genetic engineering on human body. We can potentially get rid of, uh, for example, Alzheimer's. We can potentially get rid of, uh, let's say, type 2 diabetes. We can lower the risks of coronary disease and so on and so forth. Now, all these are within realms of possibilities. Some are already happening. Some are absolutely, uh, you know, within within foreseeable future, right? So, yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of abundance of today. What we do is sick care. We don't do health care. You know, you turn to a hospital or a doctor when you are sick. Today, the, tomorrow, the thing will be converted into healthcare. You are actually taking care proactively your health. You are preventing and predicting and taking care and not turning into a situation when you are sick. It's sick care, it's not healthcare. So that's the fundamental change that will happen. Yep, next. And if you're not happy, I'm uh, happy to, uh, with your answer, please, this is my email ID. You can uh, send me your questions. We can get into later on conversations. Yeah, go ahead. So how do we know when technology is mature? Can you hear me? Uh -huh. That's your sense. So let me give you a perspective here. So there's a company in uh, insurance company in Belgium. So they have uh, structured two teams. One team is completely an AI team. No human being. It's of course an AI system, which is continuously scanning thousands of documents and millions of articles and journals and discoveries and all that. That is one. 
and the second is a team of human beings which is augmenting the ai findings with their sense making so sense making is going to be very important so as i shown in that video of that antelopes who were really always on the lookout uh, you know i mean that's what is needed if you go to masai mara i went last year you know what happens is if you look at a bunch of antelopes they kind of 50% of them look at one side and the balance 50% look at the other side why they so that they have a 360 view of where this potential predator is coming from do we do that in our lives we don't do that can we do that it's a metaphor i know but how can we be a lot more alert and agile and mindful and watchful and today ai is there to scan through all the documents every discovery but again these may be still appearing it's like the chinese bamboo story it's already five years late can you sense like what elon musk does five years in advance so you have to be on a lot more lookout lot more reading study and sense making yeah, Sindhu. Um, the next question is, how will this shift globalization depending on a person's social environment? Sorry, come again. How will this shift globalization depending yeah. on a person's social environment? I'm not sure I understood the question shift globalization person's social environment. Well, I mean, of course, I know this is a thing that a post-COVID person would naturally ask, will this take a hit on globalization uh, well today's globalization is all about some bunch of folks going from here to another country now tomorrow's globalization doesn't have to be people traveling it could be just the thoughts coming today thoughts also travel but tomorrow everything is going decentralized when it's a decentralized power structure when it is social commons as an example uh, universal basic income is kind of given in many countries going forward as we all know so let's say some of us migrate into a social commons kind of an economic structure you would see that a whole lot of manufacturing would happen in the social local commons in the communities uh, you know the de designs would come from different corners of the world the, the 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 manufacturing will happen locally out here and it's all about open source and uh, the the feed that it will give it to the 3d printer is all uh, from the west and the rubbish that is generated and so on and so forth in fact even before COVID, if you look at paris paris was up for this uh, municipal elections i think sometime anytime soon so their mayor who is running for the next of course uh, office the mayor was having a manifesto that he wants to he has a concept of 15 minute paris meaning anyone living in paris anywhere would be able to do everything that he or she needs within a 15 minute radius kind of access to the best college best school a good hospital a good theater a good anything that one needs to run a life so that they don't have to commute they don't have to do this endless thing uh, you know uh, so, so this was a theme that he was after and this is pre-covid so essentially so globalization will have perhaps a different meaning but it will still be a global world now, I, I don't know, there could be nuance meaning in your questions. I wish we could converse and give you a better answer. But uh, given the limitations of this conferencing mechanism, let's stay with this for now. Uh, if you have more questions, please, uh, uh, yeah, uh, let me know. Go ahead, Sindhu. Yeah. So we have about five more questions, uh, Suman. So the oh, next okay. one is, uh, uh, I want to, uh, so somebody wants to understand the EXO example of Airbnb. If you could elaborate on that. Well, more enough and more books have been written on uh, Airbnb. So I would not like to attend that right now. But uh, suffice to say, I think of the EXO, uh, 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 you know, the framework elements. So the EXO framework says that four of the elements have to be very radically used to give them exponential power. So they're using the leveraged assets, which is understandable. They're, they're uh, asset light, right? Just imagine. Hyatt Hotel has got 45,000 employees and they have 4,500 odd rooms in the world, something like that. And these folks have got some excess of 6 million rooms and they have only, uh, you know, a few thousand employees, some 3,000 or 4,000 employees. I mean, so they are leveraging assets, they are uh, powering it with algorithms, they have a very strong interface, uh, you know, I mean, you name it. So these are some of the aspects of the EXO framework that they use in the reverse engineering, 
they did not become EXO by design, but when we did the reverse engineering, we figured out, like we did a research on 150 such companies who are exponentially growing, right? Airbnb, of course, has been exponentially growing over the last 10 years. They went through these processes. So that's what it only reveals. But there are a lot more to the whole thing. And experimentation, that's the other thing. They're continually experimenting. They pretty much started with the one end of the value chain. Let's, let's compare a Marriott and an Airbnb. Marriott, if you check into a Marriott, you can get everything done out there, starting from your salon needs to your pub needs to your gym needs to your dinner to your, uh, you know, everything, right? And other than a room and a conferencing. If you look at Airbnb, all that they give you was a good bed to sleep, a clean washroom, and maybe at the most a breakfast. That's it. And they disrupted the whole hotel industry. Today, if you look at it, they are adding the different components of the value chain. Because when you are going to a new city, you would like to experience the food experience, the pub experience, the heritage experience, and all of that. And they are adding all this stuff into the value chain, and they are trying to complete the value chain, right? I mean, so it's a, it's a very different thing of disruption that you go at just one part of the value chain, disrupt it, and then you build up the complete value chain. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. Uh, our next question, Suman. Um, how do we create a roadmap for exponential journey of existing organization? Yeah, so as I said, there are two options. Of course, as I said, uh, there are these uh, number of frameworks, number of tools, number of themes, number of concepts. Uh, you can always go through the books, which is open source. You can always uh, take help of uh, people like us and the community. There is a larger community globally. If you're a global company, for you, uh, just for you to know that there are 3,000 folks uh, like me around the world. We are built as an EXO goes without saying across 112 countries. We are a purpose-driven community. Our purpose is to transform the world for a better future. And we do a whole lot of stuff, I mean, uh, voluntarily and so on. And uh, so, so basically, uh, as a global company, you can access resources across the globe. And it's a very virtual thing. For example, today, as I was talking about a company in Dubai, I've been doing for companies in Australia, Portugal, and uh, you know, different countries, all sitting in India. At times, I do have to travel, but I sit from here and do it. Yeah. And this is pre-COVID. Nothing has changed. COVID. COVID has not changed anything. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do we ensure sustainable and winning mindset amidst a challenge like COVID? Oh, absolutely. That's a large part of the conversation. In fact, one of the models that we, uh, this thing is, we are actually doing a lot of scenario planning for some of our clients. Uh, what we are building in is a donut model. Look it up, donut model. It's called a donut model. And there are several models. So donut model is a model that helps you really uh, achieve. In fact, most of the purpose statements, if you look at of the Fortune, you know, 500 companies that are changing, right? I mean, going through right now, I'm not talking of the new age companies who start with a purpose. Many of them start with a purpose. Of course, some of them do have, which is more as a decoration piece. It's like, you know, we have vision statement of all the companies and you ask 90% of the folks, what's your vision statement? No one knows. It's pretty much uh, very similar, uh, but people who really genuinely uh, do the purpose, I think uh, they, they, are, they are doing extremely well uh, on, on that front. Yeah, so uh, so so my, my sense is, I think I lost the question. Uh, anyway, I lost the question, so. How to ensure a sustainable and winning mindset. Yeah, so, 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 so most of the purposes are extremely, you know, I mean, everyone is worried about the planet. Everyone wants to impact in some way or the other a sustainable future. And COVID is going to precipitate that journey uh, pretty much much stronger it will hurt much stronger so uh, I, I will not be surprised that when you are crafting the purpose of your existence i think sustainability will become perhaps a part of the whole thing even if it's not a part of the statement doesn't matter everything that you will do that you know uh, if you have to draw uh, the the involvement of the stakeholders in the community a purpose that really does not take care of the big problem that the world is faced with no one will come forward. Five years from now, I can guarantee you, if you don't care for the earth, you will not even get employees to work for you. Mind it. I'm making this statement on April 23rd, 2020. Just mind it. That's how it is going to work. Yeah. 
thanks suman so the next question is uh, what should be the talent readiness for organizations and government readiness uh, for such a change no i think first is leadership readiness if we consider leadership is ready that's absolutely not it's the leadership who is driving the company all that i have talked about is not for the talent for everybody for sure but it's for the leadership to first understand so our first product is actually of course what we called is the shock and awe which is the awake session which is for the leadership the leadership needs to understand it is not a lip service so we are investing in technology no it's not about technology it's about changing your business model in fact the tcs ceo has made the statement just two days back that we have been doing this business for the last he said 20 years actually 40 50 years the business model remains the same and that is true for all the software services companies if you look at or most companies for decades the business model is the same it just cannot go on the party cannot go on for most or all companies so so if they have to change the business model it starts with the leadership it's not with the talent talent is of course needed they will be the 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 you know the the wheels of change and certainly they can go through any amount of uh, you know uh, embracing uh, any framework any philosophy to go through the change but it starts with the leadership that's where i would lay the most of importance then of course it follows through uh, the workshop which is the how so first is the why which is the shock and awe event then is the how which is the workshop which is the tools and technologies that i have told you very very briefly that unfolds in a uh, you know over a period of two days and then of course the company chooses to run a sprint it's a leadership it's a culture sprint and which of course comes out with a number of identified initiatives and so on like what png had done back in 2015 they came out with 25 initiatives they gave a target that 40 percent we expect it would fail in fact they wrote a book post their experience in fact i have co-edited the book it is available you can buy why digital transformations fail and it's a fantastic narrative by tony saldana and it gives a backroom kitchen experience of what really went through and how the leadership had to play its role. Yeah. Um, our next uh, question is, uh, what would be your perspective on the things that can be disruptive post COVID-19? Post COVID-19 disruptive? Oh, well, I mean, everyone is just, you know, the first order thinking is about uh, the supply chain, uh, which is already disrupted, and therefore uh, people will come out with novel solutions. Uh, so it's not just a supply chain; it's a complete value chain. There's a subtle difference. I will not get into those discussions right now in interest of time. Uh, so that's the very first order thinking. I think the scenario planning exercise. In fact, that's exactly what uh, we are doing. So there's a global team which has come together, uh, where we are looking at scenario using scenario planning as a tool, and we are looking at multiple first order second order third order impacts that this post covid world will trigger and how will the world look like so that it helps us in our conversation with the clients so i would be able to give you a better response maybe a little later but we are in the middle of that work right now yeah okay the next question is uh, using this framework um, you know uh, how can this be taken up with uh, particularly uh, medium and small size organization um, to bring in value, considering that, uh, that we need to even consider the cost uh, sensitive point. First of all, this is for individuals. This is for governments. The government of Colombia is actually using this framework to change their judicial system. Just imagine. It is for every business, small or large, doesn't matter. It's for everybody. When you come to cost, it's actually available for free. As I said, buy those two books. I mean, be a part of the community, it's free for you. But of course, it is like, at times, it may seem like learning how to play basketball by reading a book, but it's possible. It's not that, there are, there are situations, I have personally mentored, uh, I would say not a startup, but a grown up company in Brazil, their CEO, who actually went through the bulk of the work uh, by reading the books, and then he needed some very specific help on a few things for which I think he had taken overall some uh, four or six hours of coaching. So there are multiple models available. This is, this is not a community which is born to make money out of its framework. This is not a consulting company. This believes in truly the purpose of transforming the world for a better future. But certainly in a corporate setup, certainly uh, things work in a little different way. If you leave it to individuals who will do it, if you are 
a founder, if you are a small medium enterprise, you should be able to do it. Cost is no consideration. It's for free. And you can, I mean, of course, there's a lim there will be limitations, but you can always, uh, I mean, pick up the phone, talk to me, and uh, within reasonable limits, I'm willing to provide any support as a part of the community. Become a member of the community, no issues. Yep. Our next question, uh, what will be the role of HR function in initiating the cultural change in organization? Big. In fact, I wrote a paper one year back. It is on your NHRD and you have a journal, right? I wrote a paper on exponential HR. It is published it's by Sage or whatever, one of those articles. Actually, I would say if I write that paper today, it will be quite different because every passing day, even my thinkings are maturing as I'm experiencing this, uh, you know, I mean, uh, with different clients in different parts of the world. Uh, see, again, don't put a box, HR, HR. I mean, just ask the fundamental question. W what does HR do? Not as in the functions, oh, HR does payroll or this or that, or takes care of people development. What really it does? I mean, the fundamental question when I say this, for example, if as a company I sell, I have this favorite example, if I'm selling drills, do my buyers buy a drill or do the buyers buy a hole? Like that, HR, what exactly are you doing? How is that changing? How are you going to keep being relevant? For example, if tomorrow's world is going to be social commons, how would you reinvent yourself? If you're starting tomorrow absolutely afresh, what would it look like? I mean, there are so many questions. I can go on and on. I mean, it's a very interesting question that you asked. Thanks for that because it's at the end of the day, it's an NHRD forum. I would have expected an HR-centric question. I mean, at the end of the day, somehow we feel HR has taken the custodian of the role of, you know, doing certain things, whether it's employee engagement. And as leaders, we have conveniently outsourced that responsibility to hr whether it's employee engagement building a culture and all that it, it's a leaders this thing and when i say leaders it's not by any hierarchy i would urge each one of you as an hr professional it doesn't matter how senior or junior you are and as you've already heard me i actually hate if someone says i have got 23 years of experience that's all bullshit. it's absolutely useless it doesn't make you relevant for tomorrow the question that you have to answer is why are you relevant for tomorrow for your clients, doesn't matter, internal and external both. If you can answer that question, you are worth it. If you are not answering that question, you're not worth it. Experience has no meaning in tomorrow's world. So HR has to relook at the whole thing from a business and a people perspective. And there is so much of change and churn that will happen on the talent ethos. I can't overemphasize the role that HR can potentially play in this uh, new regime of the exponential time cycle. Thank yes, you. Um, our last question is um, how do you find uh, blind spots? Uh, for example, a particular industry or domain, uh, emergence, exponential technology, and their yeah. adaptance on work yeah. domain. So, how yeah. do we convert them into use cases? Good question. So, if you look at an ideal sprint, takes about 10 weeks, but we have done it even over five weeks. So what the sprint does is that it's not about education. It's about an experiential thing, an experimental thing with real products, with real clients, with real getting out of the building, with real hitting the road, with real meeting, making a pitch with your EXO initiatives before venture funders and so on and so forth. And it kind of changes you as an individual. So, so if your question is, how do I scan the horizon? The culture starts sitting within the sprint stage itself because it forces you through in doing something. So that's a part of a lot of exercise that one goes through. And when it becomes a part of the habit, then as I have shown in that video of that antelope and the lion, I think people hopefully gets to do that. And that's what we would expect uh, uh, people to do. And people do it. For example, one of, uh, one of our clients is Boston Scientific in the US. They ran the sprint for the first time in 2019, sometime in February. Till date, it's about a year. Every time they have spotted a blind spot, they ran some more sprints within the company. You don't need any more uh, help of anyone. And you pretty much identify blind spots and therefore uh, come out with some initiatives and they run with it. Some fail, some succeed, and that's what the nature of the game is. 
absolutely so absolutely that's the spirit of experimentation that's the spirit of failure that's the spirit of scanning and taking radical views about everything radical radical views about customer radical views about technology radical views about everything not just sprinkle of sprinkling of some masala topping on on a uh, nice dish that you have prepared so so i think uh, that that's what really exo does to an individual thank you suman um, i think uh, we good with the questions we are over by about 20 minutes uh, but then um, uh, thank you so much suman i'm sure you know uh, the examples and the references quoted were really really uh, relevant and helpful in understanding the topic uh, in a much deeper sense um, thank you very much for joining us and spending your time this evening with us uh, to share uh, the concept of exponential organization um, and i would also like to thank all of the attendees uh, who made this session uh, good success and uh, thank you for your questions and being very participative uh, we will definitely continue to have a lot of uh, sessions on this uh, theme and many more to come uh, please do you know keep a tab on our uh, social media pages for all the updates thank you all very much once again stay healthy take care and thank you all thank you very much thanks for the evening together appreciate it bye. thank you bye bye